Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we are going to see how to develop a geospatial uh, web service with Kotlin and Spring Boot. First, let me to quickly introduce myself. So I'm Sébastien Deleuze. I live in New in France, like you can hear uh, with my accent. I work at Pivotal, uh, mainly on Spring Framework and on Reactor. My actual focus in, is on the reactive support in Spring Framework 5. I'm a co-worker at a co-working space called La Cordée, and I'm also a staff member of Mixed Conference, which is a conference that happened in France. So, uh, we are going to introduce Kotlin before to uh, go deeper into the detail of the application that, uh, that we are going to see. So, the, the first question I would like to ask is why, why choosing Kotlin? There is uh, other languages, there is Java, so why should we use Kotlin? I think the main driver is uh, to overcome the limits of Java. Uh, I mean, Java is great. We all know it uh, very well. I, I use it every day to develop Spring, Reactor, and a lot of uh, projects in, in Pivotal. But uh, to develop application, uh, Java has some limits. Uh, it's verbose. It has limited uh, type in France, no properties, checked exceptions, uh, issues with null pointer exception. The extensibility is quite... Uh, quite limited. If we compare uh, Java to the, the language like Groovy, for example, where, where we have a, a powerful uh, extension model, uh, there is some, some issue there. Uh, semicolon and the, the end of the line, that's just a detail, but uh, that, that could matter. Java is quite simple, but there, there is also multiple Java puzzles. Uh, Java has a long history, and, and there is uh, some trap that come from this long history. And I, I really think that we deserve a better solution than Lombok. Uh, I don't know if you know Lombok, but that's, that's some annotations and some helpers to be able to write shorter Java code. And that's nice, but that's still a trick. And I, I think we deserve a better, a better solution. At the same time, uh, we, we want to keep what makes Java great. Uh, Java is fast. It produces uh, optimized bytecode. It has a static typing that allows us to have a nice autocomplete in the IDE to, to, to be able to do a lot of checks uh, during the compilation, uh, especially for big projects, that's very important. It's quite simple to learn, and, and it has an amazing ecosystem. And in spring, uh, we are in this ecosystem, so we, we want to keep that. Uh, so I have tried to summarize there uh, what uh, I think are the key points of, uh, of Kotlin. So, to me, Kotlin is an elegant and pragmatic language uh, that allows to write concise code and to, to write faster uh, uh, your application. There is a big focus on, on making Kotlin easy to read. Uh, we will see that later with uh, the code examples. Uh, reading the code easily is very important because you, you, you write the code one time, but after that, you and other people uh, will have to debug that code. Uh, and that's really important to be able to, to, to read the code easily. Um, Kotlin uh, has an awesome type inference with static typing. So really, Kotlin has the same uh, level of static typing than Java. Everything is statically typed. You don't have some ma magic thing like in, in Groovy or JavaScript. Um, <coughs> but uh, thanks to its, its, its clever type in France, Basically, you, you, you can write uh, sh very short code. I mean, uh, sh code ki who could be uh, as short as in Groovy, but with a fully a statically typed API, and that's, that's very important. Uh, Kotlin has a very good Java interoperability in both ways. Uh, that's, that's a key point, uh, especially when you want to use Kotlin with the Spring ecosystem. There is uh, null safety extensions, DSL, all these things we are going to, to, to see more in details later. And there is no, no more mandatory uh, semicolon at the end of the lines. Uh, Kotlin has started uh, a few years ago, but only uh, came to GA this year. So Kotlin 1.0 has been released uh, at the beginning of this year. So that's maybe why uh, it's not as widely uh, um, spread it than other, other languages, but uh, I don't have exact figures in terms of, for example, GitHub repositories, but uh, when I, I was talking with the JetBrain guys, 
I think the figures are really, really great. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's on a good trend. The current la la latest table version is a 1.0.3. And um, the first Kotlin 1.1 preview is available and will continue to evolve uh, to be released later. That's important to understand that the, the most of the Kotlin uh, application developers come from Android world because Kotlin allowed to generate uh, Java 6 bytecode with uh, very nice languages that we are going to detail later. And basically, that allow uh, developers to overcome to the limitation of the Android platform, which was stick to Java 6 syntax until uh, Android Nougat that is about to be released. And even with Android Nougat that supports Java 8, some Java 8 uh, APIs are not available, and uh, you can't generate bytecode for uh, um, some older version of Android. So I really think that uh, Kotlin will continue to be popular in, uh, in the Android world. And really, in the Android community, Kotlin is very, very uh, widely used. The second use case is the use case that we are going to detail today. Uh, that's a server use case, using Kotlin to develop server application instead of Java. You can also develop desktop application and others like web application. We are going also to see that later. Um, this this uh, diagram shows the method counts on Android application. I, I don't know if you are familiar with Android development, but basically on mobile we, are, uh, we have limited resources and there is some limitation in Android uh, about the number of uh, methods. And with very dynamic languages like Groovy, uh, the bytecode generated uh, contains a lot of classes, a lot of methods, and you can see in this uh, uh, diagram that uh, the, the number of methods in Groovy is very high. After that, Scala is a little bit better. And Kotlin is almost at the same level than, than Java. Uh, this number of methods is after uh, using ProGuard, so uh, after removing the unused code and basically what you, you, you should get in production. So um, that's also why Kotlin is successful in, in Android world. That allows to generate optimized bytecode, uh, as optimized as in Java, almost, with uh, a much more um, powerful language. To continue the, the comparison, um, I have tried to, to put a few sentences about how does it compare with various languages. So how does it compare with Groovy? Uh, I think Kotlin uh, took a lot of things from Groovy, a lot of ideas. They share the same consciousness and expressive code, but the, the main difference is, even is uh, Groovy as a compile uh, static mode uh, de developed by Cédric Champeau. But Kotlin has really the static typing uh, at the core of, uh, of the languages, and that's, that makes a lot of differences in terms of uh, autocomplete, in terms of a, a lot of things. That's not an optional thing that you add later. All the Kotlin API is designed to, uh, for, for static typing, where uh, in Groovy world, you have a lot of dynamic thing, like the JSON slurper or thing like that, that only work in, in, in dynamic mode. And really, in Groovy, dynamic and static mode are really two different things, where in, in Kotlin, they achieve to, 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 to allow concise code with static typing everywhere, and that's, that's a key point, I think. Um, about Scala, um, I have taken some quotes from a, a nice blog post from a, from a Scala developer and s uh, someone that really loves Scala. Um, that's uh, somebody working at Electronic Arts, I think. And the blog post is called The Yin and the Yang of Pro Programming Languages. Uh, this guy quotes, some people say Kotlin has 80% of the power of Scala with 20% of uh, the features. Uh, and uh, you also say, uh, Kotlin is a software engineering language in contrast to Scala, which is a computing science language. And I, I think that's a good, a good difference. Uh, Kotlin is simpler, uh, a little bit less powerful, more pragmatic, uh, perhaps more carefully designed with uh, GVM constraints in mind. And so both languages are interesting, but as a software engineer, uh, as somebody who develops Spring Boot application, uh, to me, uh, Kotlin is a much more better uh, fit. 
And if we compare Kotlin with Swift, um, the, language is, uh, the language created by Apple to develop iOS application, and that, that is now coming for developing server-side application with IBM and companies like that. Uh, I, I felt that, in, in terms of syntax, uh, Swift and Kotlin are very, very, very similar. You will see that there is a lot of syntax uh, in common. The, the one of the main, there, there is a lot of differences, but one of the main is that uh, Swift is LLVM based, so LLVM is a bytecode, very low level coming from C, C++ world, that, is, uh, that allows to generate some native code for various platforms. So that's a kind of uh, bytecode, but more for the compile time, not for the execution time, so not for the runtime. And so Swift has a C and C++ interoperability, where Kotlin is more uh, GVM-based and has very good Java interoperability. But really, this, these two languages are very close, and I think these two languages are very great, um, very great. So let's see some code. Here, we have a user class, um, which defines four properties, username, first name, last name, and location. So um, you can see that with this short syntax that you ca can find uh, something close in, in Scala, uh, I, at the same time, I define the, f I, I define the four properties, and I also define the constructor of this class. There is the var keyword before username, first name, last name, and location. Var signifies that uh, via the property is mutable. I could have used val to say that the property will not, uh, uh, will not vary. Unlike in Java, the type is after the name of the property. Uh, so this will generate the getters and setters. You don't have to define the field and the getters and the setters. That's, that's all done. You can also customize the getter and the setter. And uh, if you have a look to the last uh, property location, you will see a question mark after the, so point is a, is a type uh, with, uh, yeah, that's, that's just a geometry type. But there is a, qu a question mark at the end of the, um, on the type. That means that this type is new label because in Kotlin, um, by default, uh, the variables, the property that you define, are not nullable, and that's checked during the compilation. So everywhere where you could have a null pointer exception, you will have to handle that. And by default, in Kotlin, you can't set uh, something to null. Uh, if I add a, a question mark after the type, that means that this type is, uh, is, uh, is nullable, basically. And you see that there is equal null uh, at the end of the line. Uh, that's, that means that I am, I am giving a default value for the last parameter. So in practice, that allows me to, to create um, a user just using username, first name, and last name, or uh, by using a, a fourth parameter, which is the location. And I can do that without redefining uh, an overloaded constructor that allows us to produce more concise code, uh, that allows us to make that code more readable, and that's quite important. At the right, I think you, you won't be able to read, but that just to show you the, the, the same code in Java. It's much more longer. We all have uh, IDEs that allow us to generate the getters, the setters easily, even the equals and the hash code methods, but my point is not here. My point is that when the time comes to read your code, I really prefer to read the Kotlin version than uh, the, the Java version where basically a bug could be anywhere and there is a lot of code and a lot of noise. So, so I can add a data keyword before the class in order to say that I want also to automatically generate uh, equals and hash code methods. So that's syntactic sugar that uh, still allow us to, to write more, more concise code. Kotlin has optional and name parameters. So uh, if we have a look to this reformat function, you see that uh, I have a string mandatory parameter. And after that, I have four uh, optional parameters. They are optional because I, def I, I define a default value. So if you don't provide these parameters, the default value will be used. Uh, in Java, that's done with overloaded methods, and I would have to 
put a lot of overlaid methods to, to do that. Uh, here, I, I can do that with just a single, uh, a single um, function definition. And so I can just call reformat foobar, and the uh, normalized case parameter will be set to true, the uppercase first letter parameter will be set to true, etc., etc. The same method, I, I can call uh, reformat foobar and specify um, the various parameters, so that's defined by their position. Uh, so in that case, you see that to redefine, to define the value of word separator, I'm forced to define uh, the other previous parameters, even if they don't change, uh, even if they, they keep their default value, so that's, that's not 100% uh, efficient. So Kotlin allows allow you to specify a parameter by its name. Uh, when you have uh, a few parameters like here that allow you to, to specify the word separator uh, parameter uh, to customize its value without defining the other, uh, the other one. So again, that's designed to allow you to write concise code and readable code. You can also customize the other ones. That's, uh, that's the same. So. Um, and null safety is very important in Kotlin. Uh, in fact, before working with Kotlin, I, I was not sure about the, the usefulness of this feature. I mean, we all have uh, issues with null pointer uh, exceptions, but um, yeah, uh, while using Kotlin, while developing uh, uh, Kotlin applications, I really feel that that's one of the most important features of the languages. So. Um, as I said previously, if you don't put a question mark after the type, that means the, the type is not nullable, so you won't be able to, to put a null value there. And if you add a question mark, you, you are able to, to, to put this value to, to this property or this variable to null. Uh, the IDE uh, gives you some hints to say you, okay, uh, here, uh, there is a risk to have a null value, so uh, there is various operators to, to, to provide a default value if, the, if this is null or thing like that. So you, you have to handle yourself the fact, what should I do if this value is null? So if we see that example where I create a, a Walter variable, in the, in the second line, var location, uh, with the point and the question mark, so I, I'm allowed to do uh, that because uh, the both both type are nullable point basically. In the second uh, example, so location two, we have the type inference that automatically give uh, location two the type a nullable point because Walter dot location is a nullable point. Here, uh, location two is really statically typed; it just gets the same type than uh, Walter dot location. That's one example of the Kotlin type inference. And in the um, location-free example here, um, location-free is a non-nullable uh, point. So uh, with the Elvis operator, we, have, uh, we are providing a default value. So that means that uh, location-free will be equal to Walter.location, but if Walter.location is null, the value will, will be a point of zero, zero, zero. Uh, so no magic, you have to handle what to do if the value is null. There is also some helpers that uh, allow to avoid null pointer exception. So here, x, uh, x is nullable. And if uh, in this code, its location is null, uh, there won't be any exception thrown. Uh, if, if location is, is, uh, is a value, uh, x will be the, the, the x value that is in location, and if location is null, x will be, will be null. You, you have similar uh, functionality in Groovy and language like, like that. I, I saw an interesting example, uh, an, an interesting blog post from Dan Kim from Basecamp that was talking about uh, how we love the language that we use. And he, 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 so Basecamp is mainly a Ruby company, and he, he was a Java de developer, and he always wondered why, why these Ruby guys really love their languages, and they are really keen on their languages. And, and he didn't feel the same with Java. 
which, which was a language that he used in his day-to-day -day job, but he, he was not able to say that he loved Java. And, and while working with Kotlin, he, he wrote this blog post and he, he wrote, for, for, many, for many years, my perspective was simple. I didn't have to love Java or whatever programming languages to do my work well. That all changed a few months ago when, when he used Kotlin because basically the, the language helped him and, and he really understood finally what the Ruby guys or that kind of community really feel. So that's hard to explain with slides, but you, I guess you will or not uh, feel that when developing some uh, Kotlin application. So now that we have seen a quick overview of uh, Kotlin, uh, let's talk about using Kotlin uh, for developing Spring application. So a few months ago, I added support for Kotlin in start.spring.io. So uh, I guess uh, some of you already know uh, that's a website that generates some um, uh, project skeleton to start to bootstrap your project. Uh, so if you go to the URL that is at the top of the slide, you will have a custom form with Kotlin already selected, and you will just have to add your dependencies, uh, choose uh, Maven or Gradle, specify the boot version, and that will automatically generate a Spring Boot and Kotlin project. If you go to the regular start.spring.io, uh, start you will have to switch to full, uh, the full version of the form and select Kotlin at the, at the end instead of Java. I have put some barcodes if you want to, to have uh, the URL with your, with your mobile. I think using Spring Boot and Kotlin together makes sense because they share, they share the same pragmatic and innovative mindset. Uh, I mean, they are both, uh, both innovative. For example, yeah, Spring Boot uh, bring a lot of new stuff, innovation, really nice, but also uh, reuse the ecosystem reuse the Java ecosystem very well and don't try to reinvent the wheel. So that's why I, th I think that's innovative and pragmatic. And, and Kotlin is very much about the same thing. It's about allow allowing you to write efficiently your applications, but without uh, creating a whole new ecosystem where everybody is developing Kotlin. And, and we have seen that in some languages like in Scala of, or, or something has to be Scala-ish to be used. Uh, if not, that does not feel good. And I think Kotlin is less opinionated ab ab about that and allow much more to, to reuse the existing ecosystem. And that's why uh, that's a good fit with Spring, which is written in, in, in Java. And we are, we are going to make some improvement to make uh, using Spring and Kotlin together the best as we can. And that's worked pretty well, in fact. We, when developing some application, some Spring Boot application with Kotlin, we, that don't feel uh, not designed for that, uh, that's, that's pretty nice. So I think that's one of the key points why, why these two technologies used together uh, is, uh, is great. I'm not here to say that uh, everything is perfect. Uh, there is some friction points. Some, some have been already uh, uh, fixed. Um, some, some of them remain. So the, one of the friction points that remains uh, is uh, a little issue with, um, with annotations. I mean, um, in, in, cut, in Java, when you have uh, an annotation, a reattribute, and you want to specify only one, uh, one value, for example, if you want to write request mapping method equals request method dot get, that works automatically in Java because uh, in, in if you have a look to request mapping method annotation, that's, uh, uh, that's an array, an array of request method. And if you specify a single value, that's fine, that works in Java. In Kotlin, and I think that's the same in Scala, uh, you, you have to specify that's an array of something. So the syntax is a little bit longer in Kotlin, and that's not very nice, so nothing blocking, but that's not very, uh, that's not very great to use. So there is two, two one workaround and one real fix. So uh, one workaround for this specific case, which is a much uh, the, the more common, is to use the new annotation aliases that we have put in Spring uh, Framework 4.3. Uh, so in Spring Framework 4.3 and 5 and later version, you have get mapping, post mapping, put mapping, delete mapping, some shortcuts, uh, a little bit like what we, you have in the JAX RS world. 
that allow you to specify that that's a regular request mapping with the same options, but the method is fixed to a single get or a single post or a single delete. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's nice because that's a, uh, that's a void to have. Because if you specify request mapping with no method, basically uh, every method is mapped and that could also cause some unexpected behavior. So that's, that's pretty nice to have this shortcut. And with this shortcut, we don't have the, the array of uh, issue. Uh, in in uh, Kotlin 1.1, um, this issue is likely to be fixed. So like in Java, you will be able to, to specify a single value uh, for um, uh, array uh, annotation uh, values. The second issue is uh, come from a design decision uh, from Kotlin. So th there, there has been a lot of discussion about this particular design point. Uh, some, some people are happy with that choice, Somebody are, some are not. But in Kotlin, the classes are final by default. You will see later that Kotlin allows some additional extensibility. So, but by default, uh, class, classes are final. Uh, in Java, by default, the classes are open. And you, you, you have to put final to say, OK, don't extend this class. Don't allow to extend this class or don't allow to override this method. In Kotlin, that's the other way around. Uh, by default, class and methods are, are final. And you have to use the open keyword to specify uh, that it should be uh, extended or overloaded. Uh, the, the why not? But uh, that's not a good fit with uh, some mocking libraries or some Sejali proxies. And in Spring, we use Sejali proxies. We also use other kind of Gen Academic proxies, but we use some uh, Sejali proxies. So. With the current Kotlin 1.0, how to handle that? Um, well, um, first, there is no blocking point. You only have to put open keywords on classes and method level. But uh, again, that's against the spirit of Kotlin that is to allow you to write shorter code. And that's a little bit annoying to be able to specify, to, to be forced to specify open for each method of your configuration classes, for example. So. When you can, for service and repositories, use GDK dynamic proxies. So that's the default where, uh, when you use uh, classes with interfaces, because in that case, we are able to use JDK dynamic proxies. And that works perfectly well, because that doesn't require internally to extend the, the class. When that's not possible, for example, for add configuration, or for uh, in, in some, uh, if your service of repository has no interface or thing like that, uh, you will have to put the open keyword uh, at class and method level. Hopefully, um, because we have raised th that point to JetBrains, which developed Kotlin, uh, that should be fixed in Kotlin 1.1. We are, um, we are uh, thinking about various uh, ways to handle that. One of the most, uh, most interesting one is to be able to provide um, a meta inf file that will be in the jar, so for example in Spring uh, jar, that could allow us to specify to Kotlin compiler that every uh, class annotated with add components, uh, directly or indirectly, because I don't know if you know, but every add configuration, add service, add repository is uh, itself uh, annotated. That's all add components, basically, because these annotations are annotated by uh, add components. So if Kotlin is able to recognize that add component classes uh, should be open by default, we, w you won't have uh, to do all this kind of stuff. So we are trying to find a way to um, make some uh, classes annotated by a, sp a particular annotation open by default uh, for the compiler. I mean, in terms of user, you won't be able to extend it, but the compiler uh, or during the runtime, that will be possible to extend it. Uh, there is also other ways to do that, maybe some compiler plugin, maybe some build tool. But my, my preferred one currently is uh, the meta inf one, because we, we just, if, if uh, Kotlin guys choose to implement that, we will just have to add a, a, a specific a small um, um, file in Spring, uh, in Spring Jar to say uh, to Kotlin, OK, everything annotated directly or indirectly by add components uh, should be open uh, at runtime. 
Uh, and that's really the main friction point. If, if these two friction points are fixed in Kotlin 1.1, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, that, that will work pretty well. That already worked pretty well, but that's really my, my two main concerns. Uh, I have created a Spring Kotlin project, which is really um, currently mainly uh, FIQ. Uh, so I have tried to put some documentation about uh, this kind of friction points or some uh, advices about how to, how to write a Spring and Kotlin application. So feel free to have a look if you want to have uh, more details about this, uh, this, um, these behaviors. So uh, let's talk about the uh, Geospatial Messenger case study. So Geospatial Messenger, that's just a small application, <laughs> a small toy application. But uh, I think uh, you will see the, the source code. That's enough to show you how, how to write um, uh, a Kotlin and Spring Boot application. So how is designed this application? So uh, it's using uh, Kotlin as a, po uh, as a language, Spring Boot, uh, PostgreSQL uh, as a database, open layers as um, so open layers is a kind of Google Maps, but open source. And it allows to you to choose various sources of data, OpenStreetMap, Google Maps, uh, Bing Maps, any kind of stuff. So you can see that as a Google Maps open source. So we will have, uh, so we will have this uh, JavaScript application that will request uh, uh, on the server side our Kotlin and Spring Boot application that expose some REST JSON API that allow us to retrieve, for example, the messages, uh, and uh, the new messages that are coming are pushed with server sent events. Um, the user location is retrieved with the HTML5 geolocation API. We have some pop-ups uh, done with Bootstrap. So that's a kind of rich, uh, rich internet application, uh, rich interface application with, uh, with a regular uh, Spring Boot JSON backend. The, the code is available on GitHub. Um, so uh, that's github.com slash s slash geospatial dash messenger. So you will be able to have a look, uh, clone it, run it on your laptop if you want to, to try it. Uh, everything is available. And I will try to keep that uh, up to date with the latest Spring and Kotlin version. And uh, for example, when the um, when it will be available to, when it will be possible to write some classes and methods without using the open keyword, uh, I will update that. Uh, I will try to follow the, the evolution. So, let's have a look to this Spring MVC uh, Kotlin controller. So, most of the things are very close to uh, Java regular Spring MVC controllers. Uh, I have tried to highlight the main differences. So, in Kotlin, Classes are public by default, so you don't have to specify the public keywords. Uh, the methods are also public by default. You don't, don't have to specify the public keyword too. As of Spring Framework 4.3, and that's not specific to Kotlin, but I, I would like to, to talk about that. The constructor injection without uh, at auto wired is possible if we have a single constructor, so that's why there is not at auto wired uh, in the uh, in the controller constructor, because that's like the first example that we have seen. We are uh, defining at the same time the constructor and the, and the properties. Uh, we are using the method aliases uh, for request mapping that we have seen before to avoid to write array of. So we are using at post mapping, at get mapping, at path mapping, and that will be the same in Java. Again, that's not specific to, to Kotlin. That just allows you to write shorter code. And if you have a look to the list uh, function, you will see that thanks to the type in France, uh, we are usually able to write a single me uh, methods with a single line like that. And we don't have to specify the type of the, re of the list return value. That will be automatically guessed and that will be used, uh, that will use the same uh, type uh, than uh, repository that find all return value. So really, again, everything is statically typed exactly like in Java, 
when you are using a class that you create in Kotlin, you have the same level of autocomplete, but the type in France allow you to just not specify the type of the return value, of the parameters, of the variable, if, if the compiler is uh, able to, to guess it. So let's talk about how to persist the data. So um, choosing Spring Data GPA uh, is perfectly fine with Kotlin. That works. I have created a, a sample that you can see in github.com slash slash spring boot Kotlin demo. And that works perfectly well. So nothing wrong using GPA and Kotlin together. I want to be clear about that. But uh, I, I would like to, to show you um, another way to write your, your, your persistent layer, uh, a more lightweight uh, way to do that, a more idiomatic Kotlin way to, to write that. And uh, in order to achieve that, we are going to use Exposed, which is a type safe uh, Kotlin uh, SQL DSL. Um, that will allow us to write uh, SQL queries uh, in Kotlin. Uh, and I think that's generally a good example of uh, DSL that we can write with Kotlin that's less powerful than in Scala. In Scala, you can write uh, DSL that you don't understand yourself, even if you are writing it. But <laughs> uh, even with the limitation of Kotlin, uh, you, you can really write some very powerful DSL and, and I think they, they find the right, the right balance about that. So why using SQL without GPA? Um, I think that's allow you to get more control on the SQL queries and uh, about the joints. That allow you to have a lighter technology stack to take advantage of the native database functionalities. And also, we, we rarely uh, need to change databases. So why not just taking advantage about the one that you are using? An example of interesting native functionalities, for example, PostgreSQL native JSON support. In this example, we are creating a, a users uh, table that contains various uh, columns. And one of the columns, metadata, has a JSON B type uh, that allows you to insert some JSON directly in it. So you see that we are inserting address with line one, postcode, city, state, foobar. And um, the nice thing about uh, the JSON B type, because uh, that we, we could do that with a regular text column, uh, the JSON B type allows us to index, to have an index on the, on the, on the JSON provided uh, directly in this column. So wh what that means, that means that I, I will be able to write some statement like se select from users when doc and, uh, a cons uh, and to put a where uh, clauses about the address and the postcode with the same uh, speed than if it was a native column. So uh, that, that allows us to do very powerful things like that because in, in, in Java and in Kotlin, we are statically typed. So we are less dynamic li like in PHP or in JavaScript. A and where you are writing, for example, a backend uh, a back office that allow you to allow, allow you the user to create some structure at runtime that you, you don't have, uh, uh, you can't know when you develop the application. That kind of dynamic uh, capabilities is is pretty useful. So if if we have written, uh, if we had uh, written the application with uh, the Spring JDBC regular support, we should have created a schema.sql with uh, that kind of stuff that creates uh, the tables if they don't exist, and they create the index if they, if they don't exist. So how we are going to write that in Kotlin with Exposed? In fact, we are going to write uh, SQL schema uh, with Kotlin code. So this, uh, this is the equivalent of the previous SQL code. Uh, you see that um, that's a SQL uh, abstraction, but very lightweight. We directly use the, the SQL types. We are defining that ID is an integer, auto-incremented, and, and a primary key. We define the various columns. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, these messages and users objects will be reused after. I'm going to show you that to write directly the, the, the um, queries with a static, uh, statically typed API. Uh, 
So uh, we are not using Spring Data in that application, so I'm writing quickly a, a repository interface which contains a create table, create, find all, delete all, find by body box, so that one will allow to find some uh, uh, messages or, or user based on a, a specific bounding box, and it will allow us to update the location. And so message repository and user repository extend this CRUD repository. So if we have a look to the repository implementation, it's annotated with at repository, like a regular, uh, regular Spring Data uh, repository. We are using at transactional because exposed supports Spring Transactional uh, in your real application that should be on the service layer, I guess. And um, if you have a look to the update location function, for example, you will see that exposed allow us to write our SQL queries with the Kotlin type safe uh, API that uh, allow us to have autocomplete and things like that. So instead of, that's a little bit different. Usually with Spring Data, you have a CRUD, uh, a CRUD repository that you extend to add your, your custom ones. Uh, Spring Data is able to create some queries based on the name of the method. Here, it's a little bit different. Um, here we are using the power of uh, Kotlin and the, the library exposed, but I guess there will be a lot of other ones to, at the beginning, define the, the structure of the tables and reusing this users uh, or messages object to directly write the queries with a statically typed API. So here, the, the queries uh, are quite simple, but in real life, you, you can write quite complicated statements with that kind of API, and uh, here that's an example that is about SQL, but you can find the same about NoSQL, uh, HTML. Uh, you, you can write various uh, DSL with uh, Kotlin, uh, and that's, uh, that's a pretty interesting use case, I think. If you have a look to the ECK uh, function uh, that is not using parentheses, that's because uh, this, this fu uh, function has been specified as infix, and infix just say that you can omit the parentheses that just to be, that just syntactic sugar to be able to write more functional code, basically, but that's, that's a regular function, there is no, no magic here. And uh, so, we are using SQL, so that's fine, but how does that work when I have to use uh, uh, a native functionality of my uh, database, because uh, as I said previously, Expose is a regular SQL library. I have talked about native functionalities like JSON support or like geospatial support. So how, how could I write this uh, within method uh, where, where um, Expose just supports regular uh, SQL? So that's, that's another example of uh, Kotlin uh, power. Uh, that's Kotlin extensions. So Kotlin extensions allow you to extend existing classes to add uh, a new method directly in place. So that so sounds a little bit magic, but that's, that's not so magic. Basically, you see here, uh, I define a function table dot point, an extension table dot point. That means that I, I'm going to add a point to the existing uh, table, a type that is coming from expose. So that's coming from a jar. I don't own that, I'm just adding a method into that. And, um, and this, this function will be available when I write my code only if I import this extension. That's a little bit like static import. Um, I don't know if you have used static import, but it's a little bit like that. If I just using regular code with no specific import, table will just have the methods the functions defined by, uh, by default uh, in, in this class. But if I import the file uh, where I have defined this extension tab table on point, then the compiler, the IDE, will propose me in the autocomplete uh, the, the point method. And that's a nice balance between the dynamic thing, because extension is quite dynamic, but the, the fact that extensions are, are resolved statically uh, make that uh, less, less magic and, and keep, uh, um, allow to keep the control about what, uh, what, uh, what extension I use. Because if we, we don't add this static uh, resolution, um, if I wrote uh, 100 extensions, uh, that, that would be not uh, manageable. So. 
Here we have a look to the configuration class. So that's a regular Spring Boot configuration class annotated with Spring Boot application. So open keyword is needed at class and method level because we don't, uh, because we are using CJLib to extend that class internally. Um, in as of uh, Spring Framework 4.3, Kotlin Jackson module is automatically registered, so you don't have to register it. In that case, I'm using that to register the PostGIS module that allows to Jackson to deal with uh, ge geographic types. And the main function uh, don't have to be wrapped into a class. You, you can put that as a top-level function. That works. The Gradle uh, file is a regular one. Um, the points specific to Kotlin are the Kotlin Gradle plugin that you specify, and the Kotlin stdlib and uh, Kotlin Reflect libraries. Um, the rest is just regular Java dependencies. Um, I don't have specified that previously, but you can totally mix Java and Kotlin code into the same code base. That works perfectly well. And that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, there is a very good interrupt bet between these both technologies. Uh, recently, Gradleware announced that uh, Kotlin, Gradle goes Kotlin. So wh what that means, uh, as you may know, Gradle is using Groovy to describe uh, the, the build.gradle file, where you specify and you configure your build. Uh, and it allows to use Groovy to, to develop the plugins, for example. Uh, that will be still supported, of course, but uh, Gradle is really switching uh, to Kotlin for the main uh, languages uh, used to describe your, your build. So uh, they, they do this switch because, as I said previously, Kotlin allows to write short code like in Groovy, but with static typing uh, and, and um, in terms of autocomplete, for example, uh, in, in the various IDEs, the autocomplete is, uh, in Gradle is just uh, does not work, <laughs> basically. Uh, with Kotlin, uh, by default, you have full autocomplete. Everything works. And that gives more control about the plugin ecosystem and things like that. So that's not a small, a small move. And uh, with Gradle 3, you, you will see that, by default, Gradleware is going to push for using Kotlin uh, by default, and they still support Groovy, and that's perfectly fine to, to use Groovy, but when you see the advantages in terms of autocomplete, in terms of speed also, uh, yeah, that really makes a difference. So I think that's why they, they did the switch. In terms of deployments, uh, the, the application is a regular Spring Boot runnable jar. Uh, it's um, uh, it's uh, 18, uh, 18 megabytes, so quite small. It's done in less than three seconds. And uh, in terms of memory consumption, it runs with less than uh, 32 megabytes of RAM. So you see that uh, Kotlin don't consume more uh, memory than, than Java. And when you use uh, some dependencies, uh, for example, w without Hibernate and GPA, like I have done with Expose, that is a thin layer on top of GDBC. Uh, you can run a, a, a perfectly fine Spring Boot and Kotlin application with less than uh, 30, 32 megabytes of RAM. So I won't use that in production, but uh, I think in production with, uh, with 64, that's, um, that's perfectly fine. And Kotlin has been designed also for the mobile world where, where the, the constraints are, are quite, where the resources are quite limited, so that's also a, a good fit for, for cloud application. So we have talked a lot about uh, Kotlin for server-side development. I have said, I have not detailed that, but Kotlin is, I think, the, the first choice also for Android development. But um, it could also be used for client-side development. So uh, there is a transpiler co called uh, Kotlin 2GS that allows to compile uh, Kotlin source code to JavaScript source code. I think every, every language do that. The difference is in terms of maturity and if it's usable in, in, in the real life. Um, so that's currently uh, not uh, released uh, in as part uh, as Kotlin 1.0. I mean, it's available, but that's not tagged as uh, production ready. 
that's, that's the target for Kotlin 1.1, but there is already previous uh, usable. And so that will generate some JavaScript with the libraries that you are using, uh, some parts of the Kotlin uh, standard library and, and your application. So uh, as I said, Kotlin is statically typed, so you will have to write some, or you will have to use some existing uh, definition, a little bit like in TypeScript, that allow you to, to use the JavaScript uh, libraries. So in that case, I'm defining some quick, um, quick declaration for jQuery. Um, the Kotlin guys are working on some converters that allow to convert TypeScript definition to Kotlin definition uh, automatically. That will allow you, allow you to reuse the huge number of uh, uh, API definition coming from the TypeScript world. And that allow you to have uh, autocomplete compi compile time check, uh, sharing code between client side and server side, and also source map allow you to have the matching between both, uh, both source code, both source bases. Um, so that's expected to be released really for wide usage in Kotlin 1.1 with uh, module, uh, JavaScript module support, better documentation, better in ID integration, and some uh, XMAScript 6 support. Um, that works pretty well. That generates some big JavaScript files, so that's not perfect, and that still uh, can progress in terms of the, the size of the JavaScript generated. And, uh, but that, yeah, that's definitely doable to write uh, an application with Kotlin for both client side and server side. But for really, for the long term, I'm much more interested in another thing. Uh, how many of you have heard about WebAssembly? Yeah, so WebAssembly is a really new technology, so that's not surprising that not everybody has heard about that. WebAssembly is basically the, the technology for the web bytecode. I mean, until now, we have used JavaScript as the web bytecode. Basically, every, everybody is transpiling to JavaScript. Um, I, I think the approach of transpiling to JavaScript uh, on the long term is perfectly fine for languages that are superset of JavaScript. I mean, for TypeScript, that's perfectly fine. For CoffeeScript, that's perfectly fine. Uh, transpiling some XMAScript 6 or, or 7 to uh, a previous version of JavaScript is also perfectly fine, and that will stay. But ultimately, compiling some JavaScript with very different, uh, compiling some, some languages with very different uh, semantics than JavaScript to JavaScript is a hack. And uh, yeah. You have some issues like, the, the, for example, the numeric types are not the same. So even if you can come close to something that works, uh, you have some small differences. You have some performance issue. And that's not very native. So uh, the, big, uh, the big four, uh, so Google, Apple, Microsoft, Mozilla, has, has worked for uh, some years now about how to improve the level of performance uh, in the browser, so uh, you may have heard about ASMGS, which is a, a, a small subset of JavaScript that uh, allow to basically compile C, C++ program to this subset of JavaScript and to run very, very, very fast. Um, so in that case, they are using this subset of JavaScript as a way to describe the assembly code of the program. Um, there is na native client technology from Google, for example. There has been Dart. Uh, I have worked a lot of, uh, with, with Dart at some point. So uh, yeah, all these, all these uh, technologies um, are, are nice, but uh, they are not standardized. And um, there should be a better way. So these four, the four ma major browser vendors are working for a few months on WebAssembly which is a binary format to describe uh, uh, in a neutral way um, the, the, the code, basically. Uh, and uh, the idea is to be able to make it possible for the browser to execute that code very efficiently. Uh, initially, that's more focused for 
uh, very um, for application like games, like compu compu computing intensive application. But uh, so that's mainly for being a target compilation for C, C++ program. But uh, WebAssembly is also something that could be used to as a compilation target for other languages. So we could see uh, Rust uh, compiling to WebAssembly. We could see uh, Kotlin, maybe, compiling to WebAssembly, Swift, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and that would make, uh, uh, so JavaScript will stay, will stay, but that will be an alternative, very efficient, quite low level, to be able to run some application. And I have tried to, to, to discuss with the Kotlin guys, so there is no official plan about WebAssembly yet. But I think that's, that's an interesting uh, way of thinking about uh, Kotlin for the client side for the future. Uh, compiling a language uh, that does not share the uh, JavaScript semantics to JavaScript is a hack. And for the long term, I think that would be interesting. Uh, I guess we will see quickly Rust compiling to WebAssembly. Uh, WebAssembly. Um, is uh, already available in, in Chrome Canary if you enable a flag and you can run a, 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 a video game with a full speed and that's, that works pretty well. So they are really progressing fast on that. And next year, I, I think we could see WebAssembly supported by, by the browser uh, without flags. So that, that's a, an interesting technology to follow. And if Kotlin compiled to, to WebAssembly, that could allow uh, people to create a whole ecosystem uh, of uh, Kotlin, Kotlin client-side uh, libraries uh, that would be uh, different than the JavaScript ecosystem that we see. And yeah, that, that would be interesting. Uh, how to learn Kotlin? So uh, you can go to try.kotlinlang.org. Uh, you will see Kotlin cones, which is uh, uh, an, an, an application that allows you to learn step by step the language. Uh, this application is developed with Kotlin 2GS, for example. That's, that's an example. The community is very interesting. Uh, the Slack, there is a Slack uh, instance for Kotlin, which is very nice, where you can discuss directly with Kotlin developers. Uh, so, should be an interesting place to go. And I will finish by, um, oh, I can show just quickly uh, a quick example, uh, a, a quick demo of the application. So, so if you clone the Geospatial Messenger, uh, you will get this application. Uh, we have the message, the user, classes, credit repository, just what I showed you. So to run it, I just, uh, I just run the application class. Okay, so um, so that's just an application where I can write some messages like that. Okay, and if I um, if I open another browser, uh, I go to the that one and I create a message here. The message will be pushed by server sent events into all the various instances to, to show that. So that's a really simple application, but that just to, to show you uh, a, a real example of, uh, uh, of a Kotlin and Spring Boot application. Duke, back there. So what's next? Um, in terms of uh, Kotlin support in Spring, uh, we are going to develop uh, to improve the Spring Kotlin, which is Kotlin extensions for Spring. Uh, we are going also to add some uh, Kotlin extension for Reactor. So that's not official project. That's a project that will be developed mainly by me <laughs> for the beginning and the community. Uh, the Reactor example is very interesting because the reactive APIs, like Eric Java or Reactor, are front APIs that you can't extend uh, as a user. You can't add a method to observable in Eric Java. You can't add a method in Flux in Reactor. And here, again, uh, Kotlin extensions really works pretty well because they allow you to add some extensions to Flux or to observable without uh, modifying the original class. 
For example, we could imagine a, a max a dot max method uh, that will be only uh, available when we have a, a, some flux or observable of integer of long, for example. And that's that's some example where we can we can use uh, some some methods on ex ex existing class, and that's a, that's a good fit with reactive APIs that in Java are not extensible at all. Uh, we are going to add some Kotlin nullable for class support in Spring Framework. Uh, for that, we are going to use uh, information from the Kotlin type system where we can know if a variable is, can, could be null or not. And with that, we will, uh, we will uh, know if a parameter should be, um, should be required or not in Spring MVC, for example. And we continue to improve the Kotlin integration in Spring Boot. There is no really blocking point. Just have to wait uh, Kotlin 1.1, as, as I said previously. So there is a Kotlin 1.1 preview, which brings coroutines. So coroutines allow you to write um, asynchronous code without using callbacks, for example, for simple use cases. Um, you know, I, personally, I prefer using Reactive API like uh, Reactor to, to write that. That's much more powerful. But yeah, they, they seem to think that coroutine is nice. There is that is in .NET world. So as soon as that, that's optional, so that, that's not an issue. Type L aliases are, are more interesting. That allow you to write uh, aliases for various types. And these uh, type aliases are replaced at compile time. So that this has zero cost in terms of uh, runtime. So that's also to continue to improve the readability. When you have very long generics, for example, you can use that. To, to write shorter code, and yeah, that's, I, I like that kind of zero cost abstractions that allow you to write better code. There will be Java, Java 8 bytecode generation because currently Kotlin generates Java 6 bytecode, uh, even if the, the language is much more powerful than Java 8. Uh, so that means that with Kotlin 1.1, they will be able to use uh, Lambda uh, bytecode operator, for example, to, to, to implement to in the bytecode instead of generating some uh, anonymous classes. Um, CGLib style proxy should be possible without open. We will see, but uh, that, uh, that's the plan. And we will have a, a much more usable Kotlin to JavaScript compiler. And the last point, so that's, I have seen uh, a few slides about that. So uh, Kotlin guys seems to work on a Kotlin native initiative that would allow to compile Kotlin uh, to na native code thanks to uh, an LLVM backend. So that's ahead of time compilation that's designed for lightweight runtime to target uh, embedded IoT, iOS, things like that. And that could be maybe a bridge to WebAssembly, uh, since the WebAssembly guy are working on a LLVM to WebAssembly uh, compile chain. So as soon as you are able to generate uh, WebAssembly code, uh, intermediate code, you are able to generate some uh, WebAssembly code. So why not using that to generate WebAssembly? We'll see. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have some question, I'm I'm available to answer. Thanks. Excuse me? Uh, IntelliJ IDE. Oh, yeah, there is also an Eclipse plugin. Uh, the, on NetBeans, I'm not sure. I don't think there is something really usable, but uh, IntelliJ ID and Eclipse are both uh, usable to, to write Kotlin code. And obviously, the, be the better support is in IntelliJ ID, but that's not a surprise. So it would work also in Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It will work. So uh, it will work in Spring Tool Suite uh, because it's based on Eclipse. So right. yeah, yeah. That uh, that will work pretty well. Okay, thanks.